Good morning, everybody, uh, and uh, thanks for having us. Uh, we're here to talk about Tutor Simulator, which is uh, demonstrating Tutors Live in Tutors.dev. So who are we? Uh, my name is Colm Dunphy. I'm here from Ireland, senior manager with the Red Hat Research Waterford team. Uh, started about six and a half months ago. Prior to that, I was a lecturer for 30 years. So that's my interest in this particular open source project. Uh, and Cloda, who's uh, developed Simulator and is going to take us through that. As Claude is on our team as well in, in Waterford as a software engineer. Um, our bigger team is the Red Hat Research Waterford team. Um, we uh, started uh, September, October, November, so quite a new team. And this is one of the open source projects that the team uh, got involved with as a, an introduction to open source uh, when they joined Red Hat. Um, but there's also a bigger community that has evolved out of DevConf 2022 when we presented uh, for the first time remotely. Um, so quite a few key players in there, and these people are all developing uh, tutors um, at, at different levels. So remember that name, tutors.dev. What are we talking about today? So this is Tutor Simulator is a visualization of the Tutors Live feature of the Tutors Open Source Project recommended and used by the Tutor Stack framework. There's a lot of tutors in there. So let's try and uh, unravel some of that. So we're here to talk about Simulator, but we can't talk about Simulator without giving you the background. So the background is Simulator is a feature of Tutors Live. Tutors Live is a feature of Tutors. Tutors is a platform for delivering content, if you like, uh, for online courses. And that's part of a bigger framework called Tutor Stack which involves hardware as well. So to talk about the fourth one, we need to talk about the first three. So let's start with Tutor Stack. Now we've given multiple talks on Tutor Stack. I'm going to give you the fast version this morning. Uh, it's a framework. It's got four layers. And we recognize that these four layers need to be used to have a successful online course. If your course is not uh, using or, or identifying these layers, then you're missing a piece of the jigsaw for success in online delivery. The first one is learning materials. Traditionally, this is the learning management system or the virtual learning environment uh, that you use in your university. Tutors.dev is a, is a solution to that. Okay. We also have communications and community. It starts with communications, trying to get people talking together and that evolves into a community. So it, it, it goes through different stages. But this is the single biggest point of failure in online courses because you either have too much communication, so you get 10 emails about the same thing, or you have multiple systems all telling you the same thing and repeating. And this is a real frustration for students taking online courses. Then you need a solution for assessment and feedback. Traditionally, this is the virtual learning environment, but Depending on the type of assessment, uh, you might want to use different solutions. And just before, we also have media. And if you're going to go online, then image is important, uh, video is important, sound quality is important. So you have to uh, identify those solutions. So this is the framework, or if you like, these are the, the, the top level things that you need to address. And here's our recipe, a solution that we recommend. Uh, and we use these on courses in the SETU uh, University in Waterford, Ireland, in the computing department. So we have tutors that we're talking about today, and it has two key features that I'm going to draw your attention to, tutors live and tutors time, and we'll come back to those. Um, so these are all the learning materials. This is how they get delivered to the student. It's a very visual interface, and we'll see more of that in a minute. Um, as part of the collaboration between SETU and Red Hat in Waterford, uh, we had engineers coming down making recommendations. And about seven or eight years ago, they recommended we use Slack. So we switched to using Slack, and then Red Hat stopped using Slack. And now they're using Slack again, <laughs> after all this time, uh, reintroduced uh, in December. Um, so Slack it turned out to be a really fantastic solution for communicating with your students. But more importantly, for peer-to-peer -peer communication and learning. And th this was a game changer for teaching for us. Um, we then put Zoom into it because you can reconfigure the buttons. So when you make a call, instead of making a call within Slack, it makes a Zoom call transparently. And you can do that now with uh, Google Meet as well. That, that would be another example. 
And then GatherTown, uh, which I mentioned we, we learned from DevConf uh, two years ago. It has a really cool feature in there, and I'm going to come back to that later in, in our presentation. Assessment and feedback. Moodle is the uh, open source uh, solution, uh, the most popular, I think, open source solution for a learning management system. Uh, but in our framework, we only use it for taking in assessment. We don't use it for any uh, materials, uh, learning materials. It's for the formal assessment. For the informal or the formative assessment, we use Socrative. And the reason being that you can have anonymity when you're doing questions in a live environment recorded on video, so you don't have to blank out those people uh, later. Then media is a whole minefield, but uh, the big solution there was YouTube. So rather, you know, the, oh, you've got your, your invites to, uh, to your calls, your Zoom call, or your Google Meet call. We just do everything through YouTube. You have a single URL, and then we embed that into tutors. So the event becomes the recorded video. It's all in the same place. So it makes it really transparent for the students. How do you get your signal there? We use the open broadcast uh, software. Uh, this allows us to have multiple camera angles, to uh, effectively direct yourself, have green screen, and this is all pre-Zoom, pre-COVID. Uh, so this is, this is a, and it's a free solution that academics love. Screen brush is used for annotating. And then when you create so many videos, you have to manage them. So 4K video down order for the management. Now that's a lot of software. It's a lot of windows to have open on your computer, and most lecturers will run a mile when you do that. So we had to simplify that, and the technology we used, we borrowed from influencers, uh, bloggers, uh, vloggers, and gamers. And one of the key things there was a stream deck. So this is a little button pad that you can program to do whatever you like. So we programmed it to run all that software, all the key features that you want. Change the camera angle, uh, turn, turn on a, a, a Slack meeting, turn on a call, whatever you want. And we configure this, and we did this with the students, and the students uh, contributed by creating the graphics and making it user-friendly. Um, and a pen display for the annotation. So this is a Wacom tablet, uh, which just looks like another monitor, but you can write on it, and it's very, very cool. Um, but these are two key elements that you'd have in your home studio, but we also built a studio because Hollywood studios are expensive, and people were afraid to go online because of the cost. So we came up with a solution for 500 euros. 500 euros is important because that's the budget that a lecturer has to be able to spend on stuff uh, to deliver. So I won't get into the hardware pods, uh, but, but this whole solution is an award-winning uh, uh, framework uh, which helped us then to, to drive online in, in the university. Now, all of these systems generate data, and if you're a lecturer trying to figure out what's going on, that's just too much data. So tutors solved that problem by ch using tutors live and tutors time. Th these, these elements were developed. And we found we could ignore all the other data in all the other systems and just rely on tutors. Uh, and what, why are we using the data? It's so we can make early interventions if people are failing, okay, primarily. Uh, you can also identify where your classes are going wrong if people are stuck on a particular section. So you see the spikes in the graphs. So the next part is tutors, tutors.dev. Remember tutors.dev? We want you to come and help us join the community. Uh, this is what the uh, tutors looks like. So our students, this is an, a full course for two years. It's a hierarchical based card system. So you get a visual, here you see six modules per semester. You click on the module that brings you in, sorry, you click on, on a, a module and it brings you in so you can see that module. Uh, there's usually 12 weeks in a semester and an induction, so there's 13 cards there. You click on the card and it brings you into the actual class for that week. But this is the clever bit. That's the live event, it's also the video afterwards, and the lecturer doesn't have to do anything. It's, it's just automated. Underneath we see all the content and, that are used for that class. So if we break that content up, it would be the, the notes, the slides, and the labs, the exercises you want them to do. Uh, it's broken into smaller cards um, with related content. So you might have a welcome, uh, summary advice, invitations at the end, hangback sessions, you know, with people stay in their classroom when everybody walks out and they want to ask you that question. 
Zoom facilitates that and we do that through a card and, and quizzing then to, to help with the assessment and learning. Um, you'll also notice the, the red bar across the bottom that's broken up, it's chapterized. Uh, this used to be a labor intensive video editing process, now it's write a text description. Um, so that brings us on to tutor's time. This allows us to identify students needing interventions. Uh, you can see the calendar here, and this is taken from GitHub. Uh, originally, that was the inspiration. So you can see every week of the, c of, of the course, and you can see every day, and you can see how much time the students are spending on every day. Now, the students can hide this if they wanted. They don't have to give it, but we run an open philosophy on the courses. And the idea of this is if it's light, you might want to have an intervention. Say, you know, you want to get going, and that's a Slack message. It's really simple. And we've seen great success with this. We, we brought the average uh, retention rate up from, I think the industry average is 45%, and we got to 85, just by using this. Um, but then you can roll all of that up into a summary for the class. So black is, means you're spending lots of time. Red, uh, you haven't spent any time. And if you sort it, now you can see who's falling behind. So if you look at the top and you look at the bottom, you can make the interventions for the people who are spending too much time and too little time. Now we get to Tutors Live. So this is the way we have to show you Tutors Live without the Tutor Simulator. Um, you see these cards. These cards are showing you uh, what people are working on. So if I'm in a class, I'm Joe, and Mike joins the class 10 minutes later, and remember he's remote, so I can't see him, uh, we c I can now see using Tutors Live that we're working on the same thing. So we should probably connect and try to solve this problem that we're both struggling with. That's the idea of Tutors Live. So it's who's working on the course remotely right now, and what are they working on? Peers can chat about, for example, in this case, Arrays Lab 5A. Okay. So let's recap again. We have Tutor Stack, the framework. It's a framework for blended online digital. It's an unbundling of the learning management system, breaking it all up, and a coherent tool set for delivering online. Then Tutors.dev is this open source components and services, full collection, supporting the creation of transformative learning experiences using open web standards. And then Tutors Live, that's the last bit we showed you. Tutors Live is a real-time feature of Tutors, and it simulates the in-person classroom lab experience. Who's here? What are you doing? And it promotes this online community building uh, and sharing. So it's social presence. Social presence is the research term. So we have a problem. How do I demo live personal data to you on a class that's happening live. That's, that's the problem that we were faced with. And Tutor Simulator tries to solve that. And that's the contribution that my team made uh, last uh, January. So the Tutor Simulator. <coughs> oh, I've uh, come back in a second. I just moved the laptop. There we go. Um, so Tutor Simulator does not like a live demo. So I think we might just go for a live demo. So what we're seeing here is we're going into the tutor's environment. I'm turning on the simulation. This is a course that started three weeks ago. And <coughs> you see the way the cards pop up because somebody sits down and they start working. Somebody else comes along and they start working. So what we're seeing is the arrival of students into the system. Now, if you had a class at nine o'clock, everybody would arrive together. But in an online class, somebody's starting at 12 o'clock at night and somebody else is starting at eight o'clock in the morning. So the numbers go down, but you can see who's working and what they're working on. Okay, and the idea is that you match up these cards. So I could leave that running and you'll just see more and more cards arriving, more and more people, but also that the content is changing as well. Okay, get the idea? Okay. So let's uh, switch back. to here. Okay, so Claude will now explain how this was developed.
Uh, yeah. So, um, uh, first, I just want to go through why um, Tutor's Simulator was needed. So, Colin mentioned before about uh, the privacy element. So, we wanted to protect the uh, student's identity, but also still like show this like real time interaction use of the system. Um, for demos like this, it's kind of its main purpose to show um, how it's used because students obviously will uh, be offline, like they'll have holidays and things like that. And then we also think that it could be reused for testing purposes. So we'd have a simulator and we'll have students that are for, they're like interacting with a certain course. So you can see who's on that course and you can test some of the social presence features that um, will eventually be developed. So uh, there is four main steps to the development process. We had to gather a list of courses, uh, generate the data set of the students, mock the students' behavior, and then we integrated it with the uh, party kit server, uh, which helps with sort of like the real timeness of the whole system. So getting the list of courses was relatively simple. There's already a gallery on the tutor's website which shows like what uh, courses are present. So we just worked with the lecturers in the college to get a subset of those courses and what courses we knew would be like long lasting so that we could safely put into the list for the simulator so we knew that they'd always be up and available if someone followed the link. Uh, then we had to generate the data set which was um, a large portion of the work. We needed um, the names of all the students and we wanted a profile picture for each student but we also wanted a uh, representative data set of like a typical class in university. So to do this, we um, used AI um, to generate the different parts of the system. Um, so you see here, we didn't just throw one prompt at a model. We used um, a, a more of a pipeline approach. And this is uh, a recommended thing to do if you have a more complex task. So we created a prompt to generate the character profiles. We fed that to a generative AI model, uh, which then fed out the character profiles. These are sent one by one into a uh, model that would generate the images. That profile picture then was uploaded to um, ACID repo and used by the system later on. Um, so we used different generative AI models because when we did this at the time, um, there was like lots coming out. So we tried around to see which ones were the best. And also it would be possible to use just one model for this if you had something like ChatGPT. Now it has DALI built into it, but at the time it didn't. So we went to this more like multi-step approach. Uh, so this is the prompts that we used to generate the character profiles. We can see we gave a pretty long detailed description of exactly uh, what we needed. So we have an example here of the output. Uh, you can see it kind of gave us a range of um, students in different backgrounds and uh, this is exactly what we wanted. So we used prompt engineering to generate the prompts and make it more efficient and optimal for what we needed. Um, so some of the tactics that we used were uh, using a detailed description, delimiters and use of grammar and specifying the output. It seems obvious to give a detailed description, but things like uh, delimiters and grammar doesn't seem as obvious, but it really helps the model understand one of the key parts of your prompt and uh, like how you explain something to a person that will understand it better. So you can see here how we use this. So we gave us some specifics like percentages, age ranges, um, like a particular place. Uh, the grammar you just see here, we use proper grammar, punctuation, etc. And uh, we also told it how many profiles we wanted so it wouldn't keep going forever. Then um, there's different tools that we used. So we used uh, the chat, which is on the Bing um, uh, Explorer, and that uses the Microsoft Copilot model in the background. We tried Midjourney. We also used Stable Diffusion and the Adobe Firefly model, which um, is actually available on just like a website. It's not built in. Well, it is built into the products, but you can use it separately to an actual Adobe product as well. So we found that Midjourney and the Adobe Firefly were the best. They generated very photorealistic images of the people. Here are some examples of what was generated. So you can see they look like almost like someone took the picture. They're very uh, impressive. Then we had to go and mock the student behavior. So there's kind of three different uh, behaviors that we needed to use. Um, so the student logging on to the course, we had to decide whether we wanted the student to be male or female, give them a name, um, then get a picture for that, and then give them an ID. And then we had to assign them to one of the pre-approved courses. 
then we wanted to simulate them browsing around the course, changing between the labs, um, looking at different PowerPoint slides, etc. So what we did was we looked at the list of cards that were there, chose one randomly, and then, as Colin said before, the course is kind of a tree-like structure. So we just picked out something from that tree and uh, updated it to point to there, kind of. And then uh, the student will obviously eventually log off the course, so we have that behavior mocked as well. Finally, then, we used PartyKit, which is a platform for deploying interactive games, apps, and websites. And um, it supports multiple users op um, interacting with it at the same time. Um, it's an open source platform, and it's uh, platform agnostic, and it conforms to all the web standards, so it's really easy for developers to use. There's a website, a web socket client uh, for push notifications, and there's also a pr data persistence on the server. Uh, the server is created on the PartyKit dev domain, and it's backed by Cloudflare, so you know it's going to be pretty consistent. And also just to note then that the PartyKit server and PartyKit room kind of are terms used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. So for our use case, we use PartyKit to help with the different instances of the simulation. So every time a new simulation was started, a PartyKit room was created and assigned to that instance, so multiple of them could run um, at the same time. Then the party kit room, if you look at the logs of it, you can see all the different student events going in to see what the students were doing, well, the fake students were doing. And then to improve the simulator, we just want to extend the data set to make it even more realistic and replace the ACID repo that we have with uh, calls to an uh, API calls to a model so that the pictures and prompts can be dynamically created. Thanks. Thanks, Claude. So Claude has taken you through how the simulator was built and all the technology behind it, which I know absolutely nothing about. So thanks God for that. I just want to re rewind it back a little bit. Uh, this is the, the slide I left you with. Um, and if you look on screen and you were trying to find a match, who would you match? Who would you match up with? So I'll help you a little bit, yeah? Those two. So it might be good for Oliver to connect with Lucas for help because they're working on the same area. One is a, 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 on the summary, the other guy is just a step back. So it'd be good for Oliver to ask Lucas for some help on the problem he's having. So what we want to do is help facilitate that a bit more. So we mentioned social presence. Social presence is being perceived as a real person in a mediated communication. It creates a sense of community and connection and if you don't have those interpersonal connections, the research says that you will drop out as a student, okay? So we need to be addressing social presence, and this is what Tutors Live is trying to do. This is all the research, and I'm not gonna bore you with it, okay? But it goes back to 1965, pre-internet, okay? So mediated communication is more than just the internet. This is my takeaway from DevConf 2022. Gathertown. When you gave a talk, you had to go into Gathertown. And my experience was everybody came running at me. And this screen opened up with 40 video people that I'd never met before. Frightened the life out of me. But I could see the value of it. The problem is you have to log in, create an account, all of that messing. What we would like to do is take this idea and bring it into tutors.dev because we don't want this interface. It's, it's not academic looking. Okay. So how can we facilitate gather in tutors? That's what I would like to do. And this is my mock-up of it. So you saw what Tutor Simulator does. We want to take that a step further. If we can sort it and, and group it, then we can produce something like this, which is all the cards, all the people, what they're all working on. But we can add these buttons that will allow us to create a group call, okay? Or send a group message. So you're only annoying the people that, are, that need to be annoyed, if that makes sense. Okay, and we could take that a step further where you don't have to do the whole group, but put the buttons on the cards where you could then uh, just send a message directly. Now at the moment we're using Slack, but that could be Matrix. It could be uh, Mattermost, it could be whatever you want. So this is our call to action. Get involved in tutors.dev, help us build it. Um, what's going on in tutors.dev? It's uh, open source from day one. It embraces Jamstack. 
This is JavaScript APIs and I forget. Uh, initially authored in Python, migrated to JavaScript, then TypeScript, um, Node command line apps, and single page applications, Svelte and Tailwind. So any of the developers in the audience might be getting excited about that. It doesn't excite me, but there you go. I have a whole lot of links in here because I know I wouldn't have time to show them all, but uh, tutors.dev is the, is the landing page. We have a gallery of 48 unique courses at present which are selected from 400 courses that are running across four continents and we've 20 developers involved and this is as a result of, of DevConf 2020. So that's why we're in the open source success story track of, of uh, today. Um, there's a whole uh, suite of issues. We have 30 issues currently in GitHub and you can see those and uh, tutors time. I knew we wouldn't have time to show it, but there's a link there to it. So this is GitHub. Uh, these are the, the tutors and they're all labeled so you can see what technology you need to use to be able to address it and what features they're doing. Uh, this is the tutors.dev landing page. And from there, you'll see the buttons that will take you to the documentation so you can actually create courses. And there's a course on how to create a course, okay, using the course materials. Uh, there's the gallery, the simulator, uh, you can see it live and, uh, and you can get to the source code through GitHub. Remember, there's three audiences. There's the lecturer, there's the student, and there's the developer. So we have a set of values established to bring you through those. And then if we just look at how this is all organized as a developer in GitHub, we've been talking about the right-hand side, Tutor Simulator, Tutor's Live, Tutor's Time. But Tutor's Reader is what reads all these markup files and creates the content. Uh, you run a command line like Tutor's Publish or Tutor's HTML to generate single page applications. And then you can deploy those using either GitHub or uh, most recently drag and drop in Netlify. So that makes it easier for the more normal users like me. Okay. So thank you very much. That's our talk. And if anybody's any questions or if we need to show any other demos, we can take you through some of that. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. My question is about um, student progress. So you mentioned how you can have how much time uh, students are spending on the courses. Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, it's not only about time spent, but actually about the progress. And I would like to. Um, yeah. So the there's a the um so th repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> so if I, if I got the question right, it was, uh, we're tracking the time and, and what was the other part? And progress. And progress. So most teachers will tell you, if you show up to class, you tend to do well. If you do the work, you tend to do well. So if you're not doing the work, you're not showing up to class, you tend to drop out. That's, you don't need anyone to tell you that. But the data shows it, right? And there is a magic number that I as a lecturer found in face-to-face -face classes, which is the three-week course if a student is missing for three weeks in a semester, they're generally gone, unless they're exceptional, they are, they are gone. And we brought that into, in our, in our previous talk at DevConf, we, we talked about the agile semester. So we do three week sprints. Uh, uh, we break the academic calendar. We do three weeks on, one week off, three weeks on, one week off. The one week off is a retrospective, it's a reading week. It's a chance to catch up and it extends that three week course to four weeks, okay? So you, you can see that what we would do is go in every week manually at the moment, and we'd love somebody to get involved with AI to, to make these interventions for us. That would be uh, an issue on, on, on the GitHub. Um, but currently it's manual. So you go in once a week, you bring up the graph, and then you can see who's, who's falling behind from that data. Yeah, and it, 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 if, if you're sending a message and they're not replying, very soon they're sending you a message saying, I'm dropping out. You know, you can't save everyone, but this has allowed us to save a lot more people because you're, especially in a remote environment, you know, remote teaching, you're able to basically knock on the door and say, come on, get going, right? And, and that, it's, it's usually just that little push that helps. Does that answer? Is, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. 
So, so if you think about what we do, we sit down at the end of every week, we have, uh, sorry, I'll, ask, I'll repeat the question. <laughs> Hundred uh, percent, they are manual interventions. So the question was, are, are the interventions that we're making automated in any way? No, they're not. But that's the obvious next step: is everybody's bringing AI into other software products. That's what we'd like to do with tutors, and again, reduce the workload for not just the lecture on the courses where we pioneered this. We brought in uh, a student experience uh, success officer. So her job was just to look at that data and make those interventions and have the one-on-ones because uh, uh, that works. We did it the first year as lecturers and it was just too much. So we hired someone to do it the next year. Yeah. Does that, yeah, okay. Yes. I can have one more So the question is about the interventions and the intervention that we make, are they hard coded? Yeah, the interventions are manual at the moment. Okay, and that's what we're saying. If we could bring that into AI, then they could look at what are they not attending and personalize that message for them. At the moment, we just have a playbook that we use and it's copy and paste and, and putting it in. But what's different is with Slack, you're sending a direct message. So it's not just a generic email, it's a, it's a message that's going straight to them. Um, on the courses where we, we use these, we use no email. So email's banned, Slack only. And, and that's, that's, that's a game changer. And then you get them to put it on their phone so they can't escape you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we have one of the students in the audience who's uh, Jean-Luc, and he will tell you, you know, that went, he was in the first class that used Slack and it was a face-to-face -face class. But we would say things like, I'm going to be five minutes late <laughs> or uh, I'm not coming today and here's the reason why. But you were getting it on your phone or he could contact me at night. Uh, Slack was a real game, wasn't it? Yeah, real game changer for, for teaching. Uh, and then, you know, share your work, throw it up on a Slack channel, you know. So, yeah, real game changer. Okay, so I hope you all go to tutors.dev and start writing some code for me because I've got the ideas, but you've got the tech know-how. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>